Hello, my friend, and welcome to the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales for your host. It's 82 degrees as I record this intro. My son's out there riding his skateboard. Just turned 20 years old, still riding skateboard. What's up with that? Do they ever grow up? My wife says I probably can't ask that question. But hey, this is a grown-up interview today. We have Stefan Kesting on. Stefan, uh, I ran across him. As you know, I've been doing uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu since January of 2017. And uh, keep learning and keep trying to learn, at least. And I ran across his stuff. Uh, great content. He is a, um, a black belt in multiple arts. Uh, his focus now is primarily on Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I actually met him in person uh, a little over a month ago at the Traffic and Conversion Summit in, uh, in San Diego. He let me put him in a headlock, uh, kind of a trusting individual. He's from Canadian, from Canadian. He's Canadian, eh? From Canada. And, uh, but he's built up a great following. We'll talk about that. I mean, hundreds of thousands of subscribers on YouTube, Instagram following. Um, he has, he's a great marketer and um, uh, just a heck of a nice guy. So you are in for a treat. But, you know, I mentioned uh, trying to learn as I watch. And, you know, the kind of the running joke when we train at the gym is, hey, man, you know, watch out. I've been watching, I've been watching YouTube videos. And the fact of the matter is getting pummeled, getting punched in the nose, getting stumped on a call has 10 times the impact, maybe 100 times the impact than, than watching 10 or 20 or 100 times uh, longer, you know, spending that much more time observing something and not participating you you just learn when you do. And I know the the professor that runs our school, he's told us for years, you know, the year year plus I've been there, that competing, you know, in a tournament um, is worth two months of training in the gym. Because at the gym, you know, we know each other and we're nice to each other. We we start on our knees, so so we don't do a fall. You know, sometimes we'll do stand up, but but it's rare. Um, so we start on our knees. Um, so there's much less risk there of getting injured. Uh, it's rare that we go hundred percent on each other. And if we do, we give each other a heads up. Hey, I want to go hard, but that's, it's pretty rare. So we're going 70%, 80%, 90%, but not a hundred percent. And we care about the other person. Whereas in a tournament, it's like, we're not trying to injure somebody. Right. And when we're done, we hug it out and, and, and we appreciate the competition, but it's different when you fight someone you don't know. And it's not like you can try something risky, lose, tap out, you know, set up and go again. It's literally for all the marbles, right? You're getting after it and it, and it matters that your senses are that much in tune. And, and it's, it's literally, it's been proven that the, the release of adrenaline is what really makes an impact. It what solidifies the, the the lesson, the memory. And so, when you're competing like that, um, you only have to learn one time. Right? You do something one time, and you'll remember forever. I remember many, many months ago, um, I was fighting a guy that he he joined right along the same time as me. And we're both four stripe white belts. Um, and he's much smaller, but he was more aggressive. Uh, he's younger. He had better, better cardio in the beginning. He would, he would beat me early on. And then I start learning I'd use my size and, and he wouldn't beat me, but I wouldn't beat him. And I, one time I had him in a particular hold that, that should have won. I should have tapped him out and I spent minutes trying to finish and just couldn't. And I was so frustrated. I remember speaking to one of the guys afterwards and they showed me the one thing it was literally one little nuance, moving the arm from one side of the head to the other, a very subtle move, something we'd already practiced, but I didn't, because I didn't do it in a competition or in, in a sparring, uh, I, I didn't know it. Now I know it, you know, Saturday roll with a guy, young guy, and I got him on that exact move and I, I, I grabbed it. I identified it. I pounced on it immediately, aggressively, and got it immediately. He even said, hey, you know, good move, right? Good, good speed, you know, good recognition. So I tell you that because listening and watching is one thing. Doing it is another. 
you got to get out there and apply what you learn. That's why I ask my guests quite often, you know, what's the one thing you want my listeners to do as a result of listening to this? That's why I recommend if you don't have any money, join our group, The Implementors, theimplementors.com. It's a free Facebook group. Ask your questions there. If you have some money, uh, join the inner circle, right? Get, get the material. If you have a little more money, join the inner circle. You know, I get on live calls and we role play. I, I act like a tough prospect or I'll act like you and let you be the tough prospect. Then you can play it back. Then we reverse it and you're, you'll be nervous doing this in front of others. But it's better to be nervous and fail in a safe environment like that than to do it when your paycheck is on the line. And that's what you're doing if you're not practicing, drilling, and rehearsing. And if you ever heard my Tom Hopkins interview, you know, I've had that in my brain since, uh, man, mid-90s. Practice, drill, and rehearse. PDR, practice, drill, and rehearse. So how are you practicing, drilling, and rehearsing? Who is pushing you? You have to do that. I, uh, earlier today, I spent 90 minutes on a call with my business coach. He is kicking my butt. I've been in sales full-time since 1997. I've run the Sales Whisperer since 2006. I'm still learning. I hire people for thousands of dollars to kick my butt. I've spent a couple hundred dollars a month in jujitsu between the membership and chiropractic care and extra gear. So I'm not, I'm not saying this just to make money. I'm telling you this because it's true. Find someone to push you, find someone that will make you practice drill and rehearse. And you have to practice the way you're going to play. It does no good to practice imperfectly. You know, I would say practice makes perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And they always say anything worth doing is worth doing right. Anything worth doing is worth doing poorly until you mastered it. In January of 2017, I was horrible at Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Now I'm just bad, but not horrible. But it was worth it. It was worth being winded. It was worth getting hurt. It was worth, you know, tapping five, six, eight, ten times in a six-minute sparring session. You know, now those big guys, maybe they only get me two or three times instead of six or ten times. Some of the guys that would get me four or five times, now we fight maybe to a draw. And so, you know, I'm getting better. But it was worth doing poorly until I got good at it, or at least better. I have a seven-year plan to black belt. Wish me luck. Uh, so, what are you willing to do poorly? Okay, whatever you're willing to do poorly until you master, then I guarantee you, you will master it. You will become good at it. You'll become great at it. Uh, and it'll be uh, the defining event, maybe in your life, certainly in your business, maybe for that year. But you'll build on that. So, who's pushing you? Okay, there's. I appreciate you listening, right? I listen to podcasts. I read books. I interview people, but I also apply. I take massive action. Sometimes things don't work. Sometimes I'll invite people to an event or a webinar and nobody shows or one or two people register and I got to cancel it. Okay. It happens. I'll send emails and people will opt out. I send emails this weekend and people complain. Okay, fine. Hit send, ship it. Okay. Publish, launch. Let people know you're in business. You know, I always ask, if you were arrested for being an entrepreneur, if you were arrested for being a salesperson, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Make sure there's a preponderance of evidence. Uh, 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 doo -ba -doo. Evidence. Okay. Easier said than done. So with that, I'll remind you one more time. Go to theimplementors.com. Come hang out. Come ask questions. You'd be surprised. People are not asking a lot of questions yet, so i got to spend some time building that up. What that means for you is you'll get my attention. You'll get my answers because few people are willing to put themselves out there. They don't want to look silly or stupid or whatever. That's crazy. I'm telling my son all the time we're in this real estate investing group. And he's afraid to ask questions. I'm like, dude, I call HubSpot or Infusionsoft or Lead Pages, whatever, four, five, six times a day. You know, between chat support, phone calls, hit them up on their page. I'll ask the questions. I'm paying for it. Therefore, I'm going to ask the questions. Don't be afraid to ask the questions. That's how you're going to learn. That's how you accelerate your growth. 
Okay. Again, are you willing to do something poorly until you get good at it? When you do, you'll be great. Now let's bring on Stefan Kesting. You are by far the meanest person I've ever had on the sales podcast. I mean, you have a teddy bear and a rear naked choke on your Instagram profile. Why am I even having you on my show? I don't know. It uh, just to add a little bit of edge, I suppose. But uh, <laughs> you know, no actual teddy bears were hurt in the making of that photograph. <laughs> I should point out. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, hey, thanks for coming on the show. It was great meeting you, even though it was quick uh, down at Traffic and Conversion. You came down from yeah, we kept uh, on missing each other. That yeah, was like the last day that we uh, last finally- day, and you were like walking out the door, but you were Literally. gracious enough to take a few minutes and you let me put my super talented white belt moves on you. I got you in that rear naked choke because the teddy bears. Yeah, the, I channeled taking the- taking revenge for all the teddy bears of the I world. Channeled all the anger of the teddy bears. They they're going out of out of business and Toys R Us. They had no home, and they they gave me the energy to get you. So uh, be awesome. careful. And you've got photographic proof, I believe. So. Uh, there is that it will be included on this podcast on these Perfect. notes. So careful who you harm. All right. Go easy on the teddy bears. Um, well, man, yeah, I found you years ago. I've had your app. Um, you are a martial arts uh, practitioner, expert, uh, marketer, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Uh, what, what other, what other arts do you study and teach? Well, uh, as you point out, I, I do. I am a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, but I've been doing martial arts since I was 12. In fact, I started my campaign when I was eight. I've got a letter that I wrote to my mom in crayon saying, you know, I want to go judo. It is not fighting. I want to go now or I will go on strict because I didn't quite know how to spell strike. Uh, <laughs> so it took another uh, four years of lobbying and I finally got to start in judo. So since then, I've done judo and karate and uh, kajukambo, uh and Chikundo and Indonesian Silat and Capoeira. I, I, I've done a lot of martial arts. I wouldn't say I'm an expert in all of them, but a pretty broad taste. Uh, what I do mostly nowadays, not exclusively, but mostly is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu just because it's a ton of fun, right? If after doing martial arts for 35 years, you know, a pretty good idea how to defend yourself, then you're doing something wrong. So at this point, it's about having fun and, and honing the edge a little bit and trying to develop some new new things. So that's most of what I'm doing these days. So how did you make the shift from uh, a passion to a business? Because, sure. you know, most of my clients have that. And, and we hear that advice as well. And I don't know if it's good advice, but, you know, follow your passion. Do what you love. You'll never work a day in your life. It's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, if you do what you love, you're going to spend a whole lot of late, late, late nights and early mornings and uh, a whole lot of stress. But at least you're stressing out over... Uh, you know, something that's semi-enjoyable and something that's yours as opposed to, you know, how do I get this uh, Big Mac exactly the way that management says that I'm supposed to get the Big Mac and I could get fired from this job at McDonald's. So at least you're a little bit a master of your own fate, the captain of your own ship. So um, how did I get started? Honestly, it was uh, um, sick and tired of fighting with the ex-wife about the fact whether she should work or not. I mean, it's, it's uh, not a lot of fun to talk about that, but um, I had just started a job in the fire department, so you don't make a whole lot of money when you get started. We had just bought a place. There definitely wasn't enough money to go around, and I had sort of two choices. One was to continue harassing her to work, which was a non-starter. The other was to do a second job. So I decided for the second job route, and, uh, you know, I could you know, dig ditches, I could pound nails, I could go work for somebody else, or maybe I could start this internet marketing business stuff that I was beginning to hear about. A friend of mine came to me and uh, asked if I wanted to go halfers on a Craig Ballantyne info product. Now, of course, I don't recommend ever going on halfers on any info product. You should definitely buy the whole product yourself, especially if you're buying one of my instructionals. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Craig Ballantyne, he's a fitness guy. And at the, you know, he, it was a, I want to think something like six hours of audio talking about the basics of putting together a website and this thing called an email list, which I didn't take the advice of and how to put together an info product and, uh, uh which I did. And I, I basically started chugging away at it. So thank you, Craig Ballantyne. And so what year was this? 
oh boy, 2002 perhaps, 2003. So I think that's like 125 years in internet marketing years. Yeah. So, uh, so you didn't start on the email. I, I've heard multiple people say this over the years that they regret not building a list from day one. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. When did that sink in, and and what made made it sink in that you needed to focus I guess on building a list? Everybody's saying it again and again and again and again. And actually, I don't know what you're seeing at your end. I think. I mean, a list is still a very powerful thing. It's not as powerful as it used to be. It's much harder to build now, I think, than it used to be. And, you know, it's harder to keep people engaged on it. But there certainly was the golden era of email list building. I think the problem was in the martial arts space, there were a couple of really sleazy guys back in the day who were actively building lists. And then they would just bombard the list. You know, just this is back in the day when you could basically send out an offer every single day and somebody would buy, and that was, you know, uh, give them some kind of um, info product or a promise of an info product to get their email and then just bombard the crap out of them day after day after day. And so I didn't want to be like those guys. I didn't want to be like those guys, and I think that was a big hindrance. But I I guess, you know, any tactic can be used for good or evil. Right. I have got a pretty big list, and I have a pretty high open rate. I think it's like 35 percent on average and why is that well it's because i give a ton of content so my basic heuristic is to try and give 10 pieces of ask free content so i'm just here's some thoughts on a specific aspect of jiu-jitsu here's some thoughts on a specific aspect of training without any concealed ask and then you know i guess the the biggest ask sometimes would be sending them to my website you know, sending them there to go look at this video on my website. If they're on my website and they happen to wander around and buy something, that's great. But that's, that's a pretty indirect ask. And then after about 10 of those, I, I do ask or I do. But even the ask is really couched in a lot of content and try to educate. So it's, I mean, I think the Gary Vaynerchuk model of jab, 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 right hook, of give, 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 and then ask is a pretty good one. Trying to guilt people into buying. Right. So I, I get a lot of emails back to me from people saying, thank you for sending me your emails. And there's not too many email lists that I feel that I'm on where I feel compelled to thank the guy for sending me the emails. So I, I think I'm doing that, that aspect of it right. Hey, I get those on the weekly whisper. I'm just saying, you know. Okay. Well, then, then <laughs> I, I'm, maybe that's but where we're rare. we've uh, – I'm sorry, say again, please. I said we're, we're rare in that case. Okay. okay. <laughs> and I'm remiss to not have signed up uh, for it, so I will definitely do that as soon as we, as soon as we finish no, up here. No stress, no no pressure. No, no, no um, it's, it's a very effective. It's it's very in the trenches marketing that you're doing. Get people on your podcast, and then one by one, guilt them into one signing up. One by one. So I now have 314 subscribers plus my mom. <laughs> well, everyone starts somewhere. Me. I don't think she reads them though, but she does get it. So I mean, you know. Yeah. Um. So, so you say email isn't as effective today. If you had to start over today, knowing what you know now, I mean, you do a lot of videos. Your YouTube is, is very active. Your Instagram is active. Uh, where would you focus? I think still email because email is an asset that you can then use to build other assets, right? So if uh, – and we – basically any asset you can use to build another asset, but it's tough. It's tough to get people – to sign up for your Instagram if they're on YouTube, because this is just my opinion. I don't have data to back this up, but I've done some experiments. You know, I've, for example, my Twitter is something I've been trying to build for years at Stefan Kesting, by the way, how's that for a subtle plug? Woo! And I'm, I'm pretty active on it, but trying to cross promote it from one platform to another, you know, to say like on a YouTube video to say, Hey, if you got a question, ask me on Twitter, that's tough. People are on YouTube. They want to stay on YouTube. They want to ask you a question. They'll damn well go in the comments of YouTube and ask you there. Right. Get them to jump from one platform to another platform is tough. To get them to go from Twitter to Instagram is tough. To get them to go from Facebook to YouTube is tough. Well, (laughs) put a YouTube video on your Facebook feed, on your Facebook page, and see how Facebook treats that, right? You're lucky if Facebook will show that to 10 people. Yeah. Uh, So... Not only is it tough for people on Facebook to go from Facebook to YouTube, 
Facebook makes it tough for right. you to go from Facebook to YouTube. Of, of course, they want to keep people on their own platform. Well, I mean, again, and they are uh, different. I mean, they're different. It's, it's like asking, I don't know, a motorcycle rider to, you know, join the Jeep 4x4 club. Exactly. They're different. Yeah, but even if they're in both clubs, because most people, at least in my audience, they're on Facebook and they're on YouTube sure. and they have an email address and they're probably on Instagram. But still, when they're in, it's kind of like, to take your analogy, when they're in the motorcycle club environment, to then say, hey, well, why don't we're also having this thing at the Jeep club? And it's like, no, don't talk to me about the Jeep club when I've got my leathers on and I'm feeling like super badass. Right. Uh, and, you know, in my motorcycle environment. Right. So I think actually email is the easiest medium to get people to go to other media. Uh, right. Because you can send them to a YouTube video. You can send them to a really funny Instagram post. Uh, you can tell them about your Snapchat or whatever it is. Right. So do you have like a, a strict marketing schedule or calendar that you adhere to? Like, do you know this week or this month what you're going to work on? Or is it a little more fluid? Uh, like maybe responding to questions people ask or, you know, because you put out a lot of content. Um, yeah. And I, I know, I'm, I'm guessing you, know, you can't just wing it because you're doing a lot of video and high quality video. So I'm assuming you've got some small type of production team helping pull all this together. Well, those are, I think, two different questions. Number one is the whether I have a, a schedule or a schedule for the Canadians watching. Schedule. Schedule. Uh, somebody gave me crap about using a schedule the other day. It was like, that's so... Uh, this is an American podcast. I need you yeah. to say schedule there, damn it. <laughs> well, I'm sure somebody in the States somewhere, maybe in northern Minnesota, says it my way. So I'll, <laughs> I'll speak to the northern Minnesotans and get their, get their hate mail. No, we say schedule. Anyhow, um, in terms of a schedule and figuring out when to publish what, I have a couple of basic rules. I try to put out uh, two to three YouTube videos a week. And so sometimes I'm scrambling for that. I'm trying to do uh, minimum two podcasts a week. Sometimes I'm scrambling for that. I try to do daily Instagramming. I try to do daily Twittering. I try to do, I've got, I've got a couple different sites that I do email for. I've got grapplearts.com, which is a big jiu-jitsu site. And I've got selfdefensetutorials.com, which is more of a self-defense and martial arts oriented site. So it is a lot of content to produce. Um, I do have a little bit of a team now. I've got a couple days of video help a week and I'm trying to act like, this is something that I know I've needed to do, but I'm, I'm part German, right? I'm sort of somewhere between 25 and 50% German. That does mean I'm a control freak and farming out things is really tough for me because I know people aren't going to do it the way that I would do it. Right. So it's taken uh, a lot of time actually to develop, relationships with a couple of video guys because that's a big like video is a big a heavy lift right that's a lot of time so to streamline those things i, I do have help for uh, you know somewhere between two and three days a week but i think the first and most important thing and probably advice that people don't want to hear is learn to do it yourself this has been the cornerstone of my uh my process and they're you know, I used to do all my own web programming. I still do. I still can do basic HTML, although I'm in WordPress now. But by knowing the basics, you can then watch whether you're being screwed by somebody, right? Like the everyone who's been in the business for a while has got some horror story about some bloody programmer who completely screwed up their site and just got it. So I had one guy, I'm not going to mention his name for obvious reasons, but he basically killed my organic traffic by about 60%, right? He made some changes to the site. Ugh. And it took tens of thousands of dollars of hiring somebody actually knew what they were doing to unscrew up the site. Mm. And I don't know what your rating is on, uh, on iTunes, but I would use words other than screw up if we were talking in person because it was a huge, huge yeah. step backwards. Right. But because I had the basic familiarity in coding and the basic familiarity in HTML, I could kind of sort of understand and follow the discussion and be sure that somebody wasn't feeding me a line of crap when they were talking about how they were going to fix it. Same thing with video editing. By knowing how to do it, well, I'm still a pretty good video editor. By knowing how to do the basics, I could then farm it out. And we have conversations like, hey, well, you know, why don't you fix that lighting with this filter? 
And then why don't we just, um, you know, zoom in a bit here and, and crop it on the right hand side. And we'll go for this kind of transition. You know, it creates a language where you can talk to people. Right. Similarly, I've got some very basic audio editing skills, but that makes it easier to talk to the guy helping me with my podcasts. So, yeah, it's more work. I think this whole, um, I think it's mostly a Tim Ferriss style thing of outsource everything. I'm not really a fan. And, and maybe I'd be richer, maybe I'd be more relaxed, maybe I'd have more time if I did follow that. But that's not what I do. So I can only speak to what I do and what works for me, which is pretty much know how to do everything. And then once you know how to do it, once you know how to talk to a customer, an angry customer by email, then you can maybe think about outsourcing that. Right. Um, I'll give you a big hint, a big tip that I did get from Tim Ferriss after just having slammed him. So when I've hired, I've had a couple of successful hires recently, people who've done really well. But my add on Craigslist is something like, you know, hey, here's who I am, blah, 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 blah. I don't give them the exact details, but you know, I run a digital information business. Here's what I need you to do, you know, whether it's video editing. And then at the end, I say, uh, to apply, please send me a 200-word email. And in the case of the video guy, you know, a 30-second video of you cropped square, put on an unlisted link on YouTube and send me the YouTube link. So you'd figure that'd be pretty easy for somebody applying for video, but no, the num you know, I've got maybe 30 or 50 applications before I shut it off. And of those, I think 48 of them were dear sir. Well, all but two were dear sir or madam. I'm so excited to work for your company. Please find attached to my resume. It's like, no, right. that's not what I asked you. I asked you to edit a short video. They can film on your phone. Yeah. You're applying for video editing position. Similarly for, you know, administrative assistance, it's like the task at the end was, you know, can you please paraphrase uh, this one minute, you know, from here's a YouTube vid link. Can you please paraphrase what the speakers say from minute three to minute four? And again, more than half of the applications are, dear sir or madam, please find attached my resume. Like if you can't read, if you can't read, I'm not going to hire you. Well, can't read, you can't follow instructions. Yeah, I mean, give them, give them a little bit of homework, you know, yeah. see, see if they're any good. Yeah. But I know. It just it's, right in the application process itself. So that's, that's been working all right for me. So I'm slowly beginning to farm out more and more work. I mean, it gets us back to your questions. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of content coming out, but I've really tried to do things to streamline uh the production process, right? Like for video, that's a heavy, if you were to shoot video and in martial arts context, it's tough. You need at least two, maybe three people, right? You need a cameraman, probably a demo partner, usually in yourself. So you need three people. You probably need a gym, although you could do stuff, you know, in the streets, um, which I do sometimes, but that's actually more work than, but if I had to go I don't want and, any cameras to show the blood in the streets, no, no. destroying yeah. people. Exactly. Just bum fights and, uh, you know, react videos. I mean, there's a reason that video bloggers, for the most part, produce so much content. It's, it's easy, at least, to turn on their camera and to start gapping. Right. If you have somebody like, you know, Casey Neistat, who I, I don't watch a lot, but if you watch his videos, man, that's a lot of work for a video blog. Right. And that's that's a full-time job in addition to the other full-time job that he has. You know, and I believe he edits video after his wife goes to sleep, like from like 10 to 3 in the morning or something, oh. you know, 10 a.m. to 3 in the morning, something like that. There's a reason. How do you, how do you turn around and monetize that, though? Because mm -hmm. it's great to give. You know, Gary Vaynerchuk, jab, 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 right hook. You know, when do you know to to convert these people or yeah. is it just a matter of overwhelm them with content and giving and, and it ends up paying off. That is of course a problem, right? And people, you know, I don't mind sharing some numbers with you because they're pretty congruent with other numbers. You're not going to make a lot of money on YouTube, right? I had last month, I had half a million views, which sounds pretty good. You know, 500,000 plus views in a month. That's pretty impressive. But uh, I think that generates $850 worth of revenue. 
So what I told him, the guy's helping me with my video. It's <laughs> my goal for YouTube is to have YouTube pay for your salary. Right? Yeah. If, if I don't lose money on, say, YouTube advertising, unless you're like in a crazy competitive field. If you were in like in, I don't know, maybe if you'd make more money if you were a divorce lawyer in New York City or, you know, some financial advisor and you had half a million views, presumably your AdWords would sell for more. Your AdWords space would sell for more and you'd make more money. But I can just talk for the martial arts space and other, you know, I've talked to guys in men's fashion. I've talked to guys in, you know, fitness. They're making roughly the same amount of money that I am. So right. monetizing directly off of YouTube, forget about it. Like it ain't going to happen. Uh, PewDiePie probably does it. Um, or the other big YouTube guys, Jake Paul or Logan Paul, whichever guy's not kicked off of YouTube right now. Um, so, but here's the thing. I, I've got a very active blog at grapplearts.com. There's thousands of articles there. And when I run into people in the street, I would love for them to say, Stefan, and they recognize me, which happens, you know, once in a while. I'd love for them to say, Stefan, I've got so much out of your blog. I really like that article about dealing with claustrophobia and jujitsu and how to, how to not freak out when you're pinned on the bottom. I'd love for people to say that. They never say that. They always say, dude, I love your YouTube channel. That's what they say. So if you look at it, maybe as a top of funnel, like a lot of people who buy my stuff end up because they were initially introduced at the top of the funnel through YouTube. So I, I don't mind producing YouTube, but I'm proud of my writing. I'm proud of the information that's in that blog, but it, it doesn't matter what I'm proud of. It matters what's working. So thinking of it, thinking of it as top of the funnel content, and then if they're on Amazon and they see, you know, my face flogging a set of ear guards, if they're on uh, iTunes and they're searching for a jiu-jitsu app, a BJJ app, and they see my face, I trust that there's a uh, a carryover from you know facial and name recognition to then making a purchase. It's hard to attribute. I'm trying to remember. A friend of mine was recently talking to an NBA. I want to say not an NBA owner, but somebody in charge of the marketing for an NBA team. And obviously, that's a billion dollar business, and still they don't know where most of their sales come from. It's hard to draw a direct line of causality between this person saw this advertisement and they got retargeted here and they bought there. That's, that's tough. They need, they need my buddy's uh, program <laughs> called wicked reports. I'm going to plug uh, that. I'm going to include that on the, um, on the synopsis of this podcast, but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, I mean, I could do a better job of tracking. That's for sure, but it's working. So, uh, working for now and I, I do need to up my tracking uh game i do need to up my advertising integration game uh but i i'm i guess my value here you know if you're looking for expert help with facebook ads i am not your well, i don't have any product i don't have any marketing services but if we ever meet on the street i can talk to you about youtube i can talk to you about instagram i can stay you know yeah you know, in the area that i understand and that i know works for me right um, I know there are definitely other ways to, to make it work. Right. Okay. Final question. Sure. Are you ready? <laughs> I was born ready. You look pretty yeah. tense. Do you, you need to like center yourself or anything? A little breathing exercises? You, you, you're good? I've been holding burning incense in both hands this entire year. <laughs> so, uh, I should so be what, good. So what I like to ask is, you know, imagine our listeners, they are, they're traveling, they're jogging, they're on a bike, whatever. They're on a, they're on a plane or train, automobile. They, they can't do something right this second. But I mean, as a result of listening to this, what's your key word of advice? What should they do? I don't want them to just listen. You know, I want them to apply, you know, go do something to grow your business, go sell something. You know, what, what would you encourage them to do as soon as we conclude this interview? Sure. Hmm. Something that'll okay. move the needle. There, there, there are a lot of different things that you could, I, and I'm sure every guest that you've had all 300 and how many and your mom, she hasn't been a guest. She just uh, subscribes sometimes. Okay. Okay. 300 plus guests have had 300 plus different pieces of advice. So a lot of people struggle with content. A lot of people struggle with content, especially in the blog 
area, right? A written content or, and video, you know, Facebook or YouTube. And this idea could apply to Instagram as well, I suppose. But really, if you're running any kind of business and if you're doing any kind of interaction with your customers, you're being handed on a silver platter the stuff that you need to make content about because people will be asking you questions. And basically every single question you've ever received could be a piece of content that you're putting out there. If one, the heuristic that I go by is that if one person has a question, then a hundred people have a question. Yep. So, you know, it, it, it's a big, it's, it's a heavy lift for people to actually put pen to paper or actually find your email address or go to the contact form and ask a question, right? That's, that's, it's a lot easier to stay on the couch and watch Netflix. So if they get up and they do all that, then it really is an important question for them and it's an important question for other people. So if you keep track of the questions that you get, or if you run a bigger business um, and you've got somebody answering all your email for you, like I hope to have someday, then this whole area of people making requests or people asking questions, if that can get passed up the chain to you or to your content uh, production people, then that's for sure a guaranteed thing that people want to see like your content production people might want to have some artsy video of you know i don't know the the sunset you know morphing into a tree that's in the middle of a field and then your product whatever it is your drone flies around the tree a bunch of times and that's all well and good but that's going to take 100 hours to film whereas ask, answering the question that you've been asked a thousand times of can i recharge my drone batteries from a dc power source can I, I don't know, I'm making this stuff up, fly my drone in the rain? Can I fly my drone underwater? I don't know. Right. Uh, people are already giving you the content yeah. they wish they had. Yeah, that's what I tell my clients. I mean, look at your sent folder, you know, of email. Somebody's asked something and you're in the zone, man, and you fire off this beautiful answer. Mm. And just go check your sent folder. You've yeah. you, you got a million dollars sitting there. Yeah, I, I would I would completely agree. You know? And, uh, All right. And why want to take that one answer to one person and amplify it out as an answer to everybody? Absolutely. So where should we send people? You've got uh, I'm, I'm I'm linking everything here. I've been taking notes. I've got your Twitter, I've got your Instagram, I've got your self defense tutorials, your YouTube channel, Grapple Arts. Where uh where should we send people to to start? Where do you want them to go? Well, a lot of people are kind of know that um, if they're interested in any kind of self-defense, they're interested in any kind of martial arts, they probably know that having a basic grasp of ground fighting is important. Um, I mean, you can do all, <laughs> I think it was Jocko Willink who said, if you and I are fighting on the streets and we got our fists up, it means you can run away. It means you can run away. means I can run away. Yep. If I get a stick, you can run away or I can run away. But if I tie up with you or you tie up with me and we're grabbing onto each other or we end up down on the ground, now we can't run away. So your number one option, which is running away, is gone. So you got to have some understanding of grappling in the ground. And I think the best place for people to get at least a preliminary understanding there is by uh, uh, getting a basics of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And you can get that by going to grapplearts.com slash book. I've got the roadmap for Jiu-Jitsu book. It's a download. It's a PDF download that goes through the basic positions on the ground, the basic techniques on the ground and kind of a checklist of things you need to understand if you want to be semi-functional on the ground or even just understand what the hell's happening in the UFC fight that you're watching with your buddies. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Or or what Mel Gibson did in uh, Lethal, Lethal Weapon. Weapon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I think uh, that's, that's that'll be a more advanced book. I think I'll charge for it. How to Defend Yourself While Hanging from Your Wrists on a Chain Against a... Man, no, well, well, that was good, but no, the ending scene where they're on the on the front yard of uh, uh, uh what's Danny Glover's name and I forget, uh, but on Danny the front Glover, yard, Danny Glover's yard, I think Gary Busey in the in the yeah, sprinklers. Gary Busey, yeah, he cho he gets Gary Busey in a triangle, and oh, it was beautiful. But that was way back, man. That was, that way, was way back. Although uh, Black Panther had, I think, a reverse triangle armbar in it recently. So uh, yeah, yeah. Um, very if cool. you want to understand what happened in Black Panther, uh, grab the book. Books. All right. Well, I will link to that. We've got it right here. I'm linking to your YouTube channel and everything else. 
Cool. Thank you so much. Well, Stefan, casting all the way from Canada. I think that cold weather, it made you mean. And so you choked that teddy bear. But, no, you know, no, we're going to forgive you. warm part of Canada. I live in Vancouver. Man, it's almost like Seattle or Portland. We're so I don't, I don't even have that excuse. I know that was just set up. You really didn't hurt that bear. But, man, I, uh, thanks for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Wes. All right. Have a great day. So what'd you think, huh? I love the fact that how open he was talking about number of views and how little income that produced, right? Things are never what they appear to be. You know, yeah, it'd be great to have a lot of followers and subscribers, but we're in this to make money, right? And I understand you want to impact lives, but you got to impact your own life. You know, when you make enough money that you can think clearly, um, you can be in control of your own destiny, your own fate, then you have the ability to help those less successful than you, but you can only give from your abundance. You know, maybe you don't need all that much money, but you make enough income to pay the bills and it frees you up time. You can donate at the, you know, the soup kitchen or at your church or whatever, but you can only give from your abundance. So I'm glad that he was, he was honest about that. Um, take note of how he talked about, he's got his, schedule, right? Basic rule to produce two to three YouTube videos per week. Along with his podcasts, um, he mastered everything before he subbed it out now. And he admitted, you know, he probably has to get better at trusting and subbing things out. And we all do. I'm working on that actively right now, really as a result of this real estate group that I'm in, they've taught me the power, the real power. I've always known it, but seeing it in action, the detail of of assigning things, handing them off to people. It's been powerful. And I'm, I'm always looking to improve as well. So I'm not telling you, uh, and I'm not that guru on the Hill. Uh, I'm, I'm trudging along with you and maybe I'm ahead of you in some things. I have created a residual income that pays my bill. So that helps. Um, I, ha- I've built it organically, right? Natively, uh, without, uh, much paid ads. I've, I've probably built 99% of my business organically just now starting to do some, some paid ads and still it's only right now $5 a day. So I'm not spending much money on, on paid traffic, but I have to get better at that. I know there's a benefit to that as well. And so, but I mean, like I said, I tell you this cause I'm going through it with you. I'm testing the things for you to accelerate your learning curve. You know, I'm making mistakes so you don't have to, but be careful again on what you see out there. It's not all reality. Being famous doesn't mean you're going to be rich. So what is your goal? Is it to be rich and famous, to be famous? Is it just to be wealthy? So you've got to get clear on that and then have the discipline to make it happen. You know, Stefan's a black belt in in multiple arts. Um, I've seen it, you know, I'm experiencing it firsthand what it takes to do that in jujitsu. And that is no joke. I mean, I am beat up. I am sore. Uh, when I get done, I am dripping wet. My kids think I shower. You know, the first couple of times I came back, they asked me, daddy, is there a shower at the gym? I was like, no. They're like, what? That sweat? Ooh, gross. I mean, a thick gi. If you never felt a gi, I mean, it's like a thick, you know, rough robe and it's, and it's almost dripping, right? This big thing. So, I mean, we get after it. So for somebody to be a black belt, I mean, they've spent seven to 10 years easily hours on the mat getting pummeled. So this guy's got the discipline and he's, and he's transferred it. He's carried it over into his marketing. So do you have that same discipline? You need to. And if you don't get around somebody that will, you know, I've, I've worked out in a gym since I was 14 years old and I've had partners over the years. Uh, I've worked out alone over the years and I kind of gotten in a rut. I was just kind of maintaining just mediocre. And I tell you, I never, have worked as hard as I've worked joining a, a school, a dojo, a, a whatever you want to call it for jujitsu. I've got a great instructor. But I've got a bunch of great friends. We hold each other accountable and every day he changes us up. I, I'll roll with people bigger than me, older than me, younger than me, shorter than me, taller than me, male, female, all skill levels. And so and I learn from everybody. Uh, it's crazy. I roll with this, this young girl. She's 19. Uh, her dad's in there with us. He's a cop. The younger sister rolls. She's a blue belt. She has more experience than me. But I was able to show her just one move on attacking the foot of all things. And so, but she shows me things on certain grips. You know, being smaller, she has to be quicker. Uh, she can't use power. She's got to use more technique, more skill. 
And so she'll show me finesse things. So having a group of people with varied interests and varied abilities is what is going to help you fill in all the gaps. So how are you doing that? Come hang out with us um, at the make every sale, right? Make every sale.com or the big daddy is my inner circle. Every week we're on a live video call. We're going through the workbook and then I'm taking your calls. I'm taking your questions. It's video. We're going, we're doing hot seats. I'm evaluating your, your headlines, your calls to action, your sequences, um, role playing on the phone. Uh, Michael's in our group. He sells fencing, right? Fencing crazy, but high end stuff like for horses, you know, for ranches. So big need where he is big money. Uh, but there's also competition. Uh, but we're able to role play and sen- set up scenarios for him and his team, how to prevent objections, how to overcome them when they pop up, you know, is that worth a few hundred bucks a month to get that kind of help? I don't know. I think it is. You probably do as well. So check that out. It's my inner circle. All right. And like I mentioned last time, and I'll keep mentioning this, this was pretty cool. I got my first one right away. Uh, But if you subscribe to the sales podcast and leave a five-star review, send me a screenshot. Okay. Wes at the saleswhisper.com. And I will send you my uh, sales training flashcards. This is, it's newly updated. It is 51 pages, if I remember correctly. It could be 61. I think it's 51. Um, but it's the most common objections and scripts, verbiage to overcome them. So Michael sent me that. And if you're on my email list, I sent that out Saturday. And uh, so that was cool hearing from him. Like they say, if there's no call to action, there's no action taken. So go subscribe, five star review, screenshot, email West the Sales Whisper, and that gift is yours. Thanks for listening. Now go sell something. <laughs>